What a Savior. In case you're wondering, what in the world? What in the world's going on? Well, he's, he's, a, he's a God that's worthy of our worship. Yes. What a God we serve. I'm looking forward to serving him in 2021. Yes. Amen. And we're hoping, praying this is going to be the greatest year that God's ever given us for his honor and his praise and his glory. That was great, guys. Thank you all so much. That was beautiful. Thank you all very, very much. Brother Zach, you come on if you will. It's good to have Brother Zach and Miss Amber back with us today and all the kids. I think Amber's in the nursery this morning. I'm pretty sure they have some little ones that are still uh, pretty little. And, uh, but we welcome them today. So many of you that are even seated in this room this morning, you had a part in Zach and Amber. You helped train them. You poured into them. You prayed for them. You loved them. You were patient with them. You, some of you taught them in Sunday school class. Some of you helped out in youth activities. A lot of you folks in here this morning helped out with Bible schools. And so... What's going on in Santa Clarita, California is fruit to your labor. Uh, and so I, I want to say how much I appreciate you. And I appreciate your impact in their life. You being faithful, faithful to the cause of Christ. And it's exciting to see some young men that have went out from this church that are now doing a work for the Lord. And God is blessing them in a great way. It's really exciting what's going on at uh, at uh, Haven Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. They've got a group of folks there that love the Lord. They love God. And I really believe the sky's the limit. I believe the sky's the limit. Uh, we welcome Brother Zach and Miss Amber. He's going to come and he's going to talk to you a little bit about a video he's going to show. And then he's going to give us the word today. And so uh, let's, let's make them feel welcome today. Amen. Glad to have them here today. Well, praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be here this morning. Thank you for the opportunity to come and be a part of this service today. Uh, w what a wonderful thing God has done here at Calvary Baptist Church. Amen. To God be the glory. Amen. Uh, I was able to come over on, on Tuesday, I, or see Thursday actually, and Dad took us down to the old church and he said, I want y'all just to wait here. I'm going to go up and get everything ready and then take you on a tour of the new church. And as I walked into that old church building, my, my heart was flooded with memories and excitement uh, of what God had done in my heart down in that building. I was called to preach in that building down there. Uh, the Lord called me to California to plant the church in that building down there. And so many others could tell the same story of what God had done in their hearts in that little building down there. But uh, I look at this building and think, how many stories are going to be born in this, in this building? How many young people are going to be called to preach? And how many people are going to be saved? And uh, the great things that God's going to do through C Calvary Baptist Church. And I'm so thankful uh, for what God has done and for what he is doing here at this church. I don't know who that guy is on the screen right there, but uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him preach. I, don't, I hope, hope he gets here pretty soon. Um, I saw that picture Dad was going to use, and I'm like, man, I, if people don't know, they may not even recognize that that's me. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, it's a blessing to be here this morning, and we're excited about sharing with you a little bit about what God has done at Haven Baptist Church. I wanted to take just a moment for those of you who don't know our story, and I see a lot of new faces, I see a lot of familiar faces, but a lot of new faces out across this congregation, which is a huge blessing, by the way. I love seeing new faces, but you may not be completely familiar with our story, so I thought I'd just take a minute or two to give you an update about how God led us to California. If you'd have came to me 10 years ago and said, Zach, uh, in 10 years from now, you are going to be living in Los Angeles, California, I would have laughed. I have no doubt about that. I never thought I'd see myself living in Southern California, um, but God had another plan for my life. And on July the 11th of 2013, I surrendered to God's plan for my life to move uh, our family to Southern California to plant a church in Santa Clarita, California. February of 2017, it's kind of hard to believe that's been four years ago just about, 
we loaded up our uh, truck and loaded up all of our belongings and we made that 2,600 mile journey from Statesville, North Carolina to Santa Clarita, California. We arrived on February the 14th of 2013 in Santa Clarita and we began the work of planting Haven Baptist Church there in, in Southern California. We had Bible studies that began in May of 2017 and then we launched the church in September of 2017 and uh, all I can say is God has done some great things, and I just praise Him for every soul that's been saved, every convert that's been discipled, and, um, and for the church that He has established. And by the way, He has established His church in Santa Clarita. He just used us as a vessel to accomplish His work, and, um, but He has done a great work. Earlier this year, most of you know, uh, we, in the middle of a pandemic, when everybody says, we should just put everything on hold and just get in you know, a holding pattern and wait for all of this to clear. God put it on my heart in July to expand our facility. Now, all the church planning gurus would say, don't do it, right? Because uh, it can't be done in, in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic. But I, I shared the vision with our church family, and they bought into the vision. Uh, you guys bought into the vision in a very big way and really supported us and helped us to be able to take that next step as a church family. And I want to share a video with you right now of what God has done. And I want to thank you. I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, Calvary Baptist Church, for being partners in the ministry of Haven Baptist Church. I can say this without any shot, beyond any shadow of a doubt. This church would not be established if not for Calvary Baptist Church. My dad just said it. You guys invested in us uh, when we were young, uh, helped us grow in the Lord. Uh, you encouraged us. I'll never forget. There was a lot of you that were there that Wednesday night when I shared our vision with the church. And there were a, 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 lot, a lot of tears that night and disappointment and, and didn't understand all that God was doing. But I'm glad to say God has done some great things and it's because of you. And I'm so thankful. Watch this video and I hope it'll be an encouragement to you and then we'll jump into the word today. I really believe that this was a necessary step. Even Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. 2020 has been a tough year for everybody, for every church, for every pastor. But to look back and to see the great things that God has done, we just want to pause and give him the praise and the glory because truly he's the one who deserves the glory. Um, back in the month of September, we were blessed to be able to acquire a brand new unit here uh, for Haven Baptist Church. For those of you who don't know, we spent uh, the first uh, two years really of our ministry in a building, uh, in a storefront building that seats about 45 people in our auditorium and we needed space. And we stepped out by faith back in September as a church family and believed God for more. And God blessed us with a brand new unit next door to our uh, old unit. And we were able to knock out a wall and expand our auditorium. Lots of hard work, many, many, many hours of labor. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears literally has went into this new renovation. But we've been blessed to pretty much complete the work and uh, God has blessed us with a beautiful space and we wanted to take a minute to let you see the great things that the Lord has done over these past three months. We were able to expand our lobby and now we have a beautiful lobby space that uh, is great for discipleship, it's great for fellowship, it's great for welcoming our guests and giving us room to spread out and get to, get to fellowship together and uh, it's just a beautiful space. And then our new auditorium, man we're su super excited about our new auditorium and it's exciting to see now that we have over 90 chairs in our new auditorium where we can seat so many more people, double the amount of space. We have a beautiful media booth where our guys can control the, the sound and the screens and all of that good stuff, the live stream. Um, we have an expanded platform now where I can move around, where our, our uh, music team can be able to spread out a little bit and have room for our people playing instruments. and. And then uh, just to be able to have that extra auditorium space is gonna give us room to welcome more guests into our church, which we're super excited about 2021 and seeing that God's gonna do, and believing that God's gonna do great things at Haven Baptist Church in 2021. We have extra space now where we can invite friends and family and guests to come and they won't feel crowded. And so we praise the Lord for that. We also have an extra bathroom 
I'm so excited about that. That sounds crazy to you maybe, but previously we only had one bathroom and so now we have an extra bathroom and so that gives us a little bit more convenience. And we also have an extra loft space uh, where we can use that for for uh, Bible study groups and for our kids ministry and so many other things. It'll be a multi-purpose area uh, that we can use for a lot of different things. And so, man, we just want to praise God for the great things that he has done here at Haven Baptist Church. We're moving forward in the midst of some chaotic and difficult seasons. Uh, God is giving us grace and giving us faith to continue moving forward for his glory. We want to stop and say thank you to all those who have partnered with us financially uh, for our family to be able to continue the work here in Santa Clarita. A big thanks to all of those churches who partnered with us in this renovation project. I really believe that this was a necessary step to allow our church to go to that next level. And so we just can't say thank you enough for your investment into what God is doing here at Haven Baptist Church in Santa Clarita, California. We love you guys. Thank you for being a part. We want to ask you to continue believing with us that God will do great things, to continue supporting us and investing in the ministry here at Haven Baptist Church. We praise God for the great things that he has done. And we just want to finish this video by saying to God be the glory because he has done great and mighty things. We love you guys. Thanks for checking out this video. Thank you for supporting us and believing God to do great things in Santa Clarita, California. Well, that's exciting. Amen. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm thankful for um, just to be a, a to be able to minister and to do what God has called us to do is a great blessing. And I praise the Lord. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you for, for, for believing God and stepping out by faith with us to see God do great things. I just wonder, maybe there's more church planters in this building this morning. Maybe there'll be some other young people who God would call into the ministry and more churches would be planted as a result. Man, what a blessing that would be. Romans chapter 1 in your Bibles today, Romans chapter 1. And we're going to jump into the message this morning. The message is entitled, Motivated to Minister. Motivated to Minister. Now, you may be thinking, Zach, this is 2021. We're in the midst of a pandemic. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. We really don't know when this is all going to come to an end. And, you know, right now, everything's on hold, and we're not really able to minister. I want to challenge that concept a little bit this morning and say that, you know what? God already knew that COVID-19 was going to be a part of our life in 2021. But I'm also convinced that God has equipped you and called you to do a great work in this year. And I want to challenge us all today concerning our motivation for engaging in ministry as the body of Christ uh, in this community in 2021. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. Lord, this church means the world to me. It's a blessing to be back at our home church. Lord, this is a place filled with people who we love so dearly. We're so thankful, God, for the great, great thing, mighty things that you have done through this church family. And I pray that you would bless in 2021 to see great, greater things and even more mighty things done through this ministry for your honor and glory among all nations for your name. Bless this time together. Open our hearts to your word. Lord, I pray that as I speak today, Lord, that you would help these words to penetrate our hearts and God, that great things would happen as a result of this time together. I yield my heart and my mouth and my mind into your control and I pray that you would help us, Lord, to receive what you have for our hearts today. We'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. What is it that propels you forward in the Christian life? What is it that motivates you to attend church? to read your Bible, to pray, to engage in Christian community? 
What is it that motivates you to use your gifts to serve the Lord? Sadly, for many people, uh, it, it could be said that they are being propelled forward. They are being motivated by the wrong things. And I want to offer to you today a warning concerning having the wrong motivation for living the Christian life. When you're being motivated by the wrong things in the Christian life, you'll find that you will inevitably lose your momentum early and often. While we have been called in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, the Bible says that Paul said we need to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Sadly, if we're being honest, many Christians today are wavering, inconsistent, and can't be found in the work of the Lord. So the question is today, what makes the difference between the, those two categories of people, those who are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and those who are wavering, inconsistent, and can't be found in the work of the Lord? What is, what is it that makes the difference? Why are some Christians faithful in the ministry for the Lord, and why are others Christians fickle when it comes to their ministry for the Lord? And I believe the answer lies in our motivation for ministries. I want to use our Bibles to create a bit of a contrast today. And I want to give you, first of all, some improper motivations for ministry. And then we're going to come into Romans chapter 1. And we're going to find some proper motivations for ministering or living for the Lord in 2021. I think the first improper motivation that I would challenge you concerning today would be praise. Write that in your notes if you're taking notes this morning. Zach, what are some improper motivations for living the Christian life in 2021? The first thing I would say is praise. You know, if you're always looking to get a pat on the back from somebody every time you do something for the Lord, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, there's going to come a time when somebody forgets to pat you on the back. Or there's going to come a time when they don't even realize or recognize the, the ministry that you're doing for the Lord. And what will happen is if you're being motivated by the praise of men, there's going to come that day when it's going to be disappointing because somebody forgot about what you did or didn't take note of what you did. And because that's your motivation, you're going to, you're going to fizzle out. Jesus warned, the, uh, warned about the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 6. You should write these verses down. Matthew 6, verses 2 through 4. He said, Therefore, when uh, thou doest thine alms, or your good deeds, or your service to the Lord, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. You know what Jesus was saying about the, the Pharisees, the hypocrites? The reason they're serving is so they'll get a pat on the back from all the people saying, wow, you are doing a wonderful job. Jesus said, when you do your alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Listen to this. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Dr. Tom Malone, who was a great preacher of the past, was mentoring one of his students who was preparing for the ministry, and they were riding in the car one day. And Dr. Malone challenged this young man. This is what he said that day. There are two times when you shouldn't listen to what people say about your, your ministry, when they praise you and when they criticize you. You know what he was teaching him that day? He was teaching him, you don't need to be motivated by the opinions of others. Be mostly concerned about one opinion, and that is God's opinion. Amen. Praise is an improper motivation. Let me say people are an improper motivation. I believe this will help you this morning if you'll lean in with me today. Uh, it's, it's easy for me, if I'm not careful, to get my eyes on people. And if you're not careful, it'll be easy to get to the place in your Christian life when you're only serving God because pastor is serving the Lord. Because a friend is serving the Lord. Because a family member is serving the Lord. And I'll begin to live out my Christian life because of what somebody else is doing. But I want to challenge, and say, challenge you and say this morning that people, and I'm talking about pastors and friends and family, will always disappoint. They will always let you down. Just this week we heard of another tragedy of a Christian leader who committed sexual sin. You know what's sad is that many people, they follow, they're following Jesus because they're watching that pastor or that Christian leader or that theologian, and it's an improper motivation. And if you get your eyes on people, hear me out. I can tell you from experience because there's been moments in my life when I've been so severely disappointed by people. And if I would have been serving God because they're serving God, 
I'd be out of the ministry today. Paul, there was a man in Paul's life named Demas. Earlier in Paul's life in Colossians 4.14, it appears that Demas was a faithful companion. But at the end of Paul's life, Paul had to write to Timothy and say these words, Demas hath forsaken me. Can I tell you this morning, the best of men are men at best. And if we will allow people to be the primary motivation for our Christian life, we'll never make it because people will let us down. Praise people. How about this third thing? Prosperity. For some people, prosperity, physical prosperity, phys- uh, uh, financial prosperity, emotional prosperity is their motivation for the Christian life. And so in essence, what they say is, as long as my circumstances are good, I'm good. But when my health takes a turn, when my bank account's not full, when things are not going exactly right in my family, then we start to back out and say, now, wait a second, God, I didn't sign up for all this. It's an improper motivation. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, 12, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You go read in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, 23 through 27, and Paul gives his experience in the Christian life. It's anything but, but a walk in the park. Paul talks about labors and stripes and prisons and being beaten with rods and being stoned and being in perilous situations. And Paul talks about being in weariness and painfulness and watchings and hunger and thirst and fasting and cold and nakedness. Now, we won't use those verses to put on our track, right? Because that won't be too enticing for people to come into the Christian life. But the reality is the Christian life is not all about health, wealth, and prosperity, as some might lead us to believe. You see, it's a good thing prosperity wasn't Paul's motivation because if it had been, guess what? He wouldn't have been able to say in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4 and verse number 7. I want you to turn there with me this morning if you would in your Bible because you need to see this because this is my heart for you today that you could say with the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4 and verse number 7, a very familiar passage of Scripture. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I'm I'm looking at your pastor down here on the front row, and I promise you that's his heart for you today. And I served in this ministry for many, many years, and sadly, there was a revolving door on the back door many times. People would go out about as fast as they came in. And may God give us some people in 2021 who say, by God's grace, Zach, I want to be a steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the Lord kind kind of Christian. Well, if you're going to do that, you can't be motivated by praise. You can't be motivated by people. You can't be motivated by prosperity. So what what is it? What is it that should be our primary motivation for walking with God, for serving God, for living for Jesus each and every day of our life? And if we were to go to the Apostle Paul today and say, Paul, can you tell me what it was that motivated you in living out your Christian life? What was it that allowed you to be able to get to the end of your journey and say, I fought a good fight, I kept the faith, I finished my course? The Apostle Paul, I believe, would look back at us and say this. My life in ministry was not motivated by praise. There were many who didn't approve of my message. My life in ministry was not built upon a person. I had my fair share of disappointments in people. It was not motivated by prosperity. I knew what it was to face hard times even while serving Jesus. Paul would say this. My life in ministry was founded upon this simple principle. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and because he is, he is worth serving and living for. Look at it in verse number one. We start to get a window into it from the very first words. He says, Paul, a servant. What a title. Not Paul, uh, a pastor. That'll come in just a moment when he mentions being an apostle, but before he ever gets to uh, Paul, an apostle, he says, I am Paul, a servant. It's a Greek word, doulos, which simply means to be a slave. It's one who gives himself up to the will of another. And it's not talking about slavery the way we think of it. It's not forced labor. It's not browbeating somebody into uh, submission. And by the way, I feel a lot of liberty, so I feel like I want to chase all these little uh, rabbit trails this morning. But I want to tell you right now, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He won't force you to serve him this year. 
Hebrews tells us that we will endure the chastening of God if we run from him, but God will never force you, chain you, and handcuff you to your ministry and say, whether you like it or not, you will serve me. Paul says, I am a voluntary servant. I have chosen of my own volition, of my own will. It's not that I I have to serve Jesus. Paul says, I want to serve Jesus. Paul says, it's not about that. I'm not being forced. Paul says, I'm willing. I'm ready to do whatever God wants me to do. I'm willing to go wherever God wants me to serve, whenever he wants me to serve him. I am Paul and I am a servant. But then he says in verse one, I am called to be an apostle. You see, Paul understood something really powerful and I want you to understand this morning. Paul understood that he had been invited by God to participate in his story. Paul says, I, am, I was chosen. Uh, he says, I'm called, which means to be invited to be an apostle, to be an ambassador of the gospel. Who were the apostles, by the way? They were eyewitnesses of the resurrected Christ who were chosen as the ones who would be used to preach the gospel, to establish the church, and to complete the scriptures. Paul says, man, this ministry that God has called me to is a big deal. And I'm honored and blessed to be able to follow God and to uh, fulfill the calling, the invitation that he has put on my life. Did you notice what he says? Look back there in the verse. You really need to get this in verse number one. Paul says, let me tell you about who I am. I am a servant. I am an apostle of Jesus Christ. Look at the next thing he says about himself. I am separated unto the gospel of God. Now that right there is biblical separation, if anybody wants to know. So many times we look at separation as, well, I'm a Christian, so I can't do this, and I can't wear that, and I can't go there, and I can't live like that. Paul says, it's not about what I can't do. Paul says, it's about what I can do. I've not been separated. Yes, I I am separated from some of these things, but it ain't the, the primary focus of my life. Paul says, the main thing is, I don't have to do that anymore. I get to live my life for Jesus. Oh, I'm separated under the gospel. It means to be set apart for a purpose. You see, Paul didn't view the Christian life as a negative. He viewed it as a positive. Paul said, I'm separated. I have the joy. I have the privilege to serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Well, how would that change our hearts if we stopped viewing the Christian life as a negative? looking at the rest of the world, living their life that they live and thinking, man, I don't get to go there. I don't get to do that. I don't get to participate in those things. And instead of thinking like that, we start thinking, man, I get to do this. I get to teach a Sunday school. I get to sing in the choir. I get to play an instrument. I get to minister to people. And I get to be a a part of God's story. God's invited me in. Charles Ellicott said Paul was singled out and set apart to convey the message of salvation from God to man. What a separation that is. What a joy to to share the gospel. And that's the heart of the book of Romans, by the way. I've got to hurry. It's an inspired letter. It was written to believers in the city of Rome. And the theme of the epistle to the Romans is the gospel. Charles Spurgeon said this letter was Paul's opportunity to expound the gospel. Uh, 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 Charles, uh, excuse me, Harold Wilmington said that the book of Romans is essentially the constitution and the bill of rights of the Christian faith. Holman Study Bible said the letter uh, to the Romans was Paul's opportunity to share in the good news of Jesus Christ. And I believe as we get into these opening verses, we see Paul's motivation for minute, excuse me, for ministry. Notice number one, we see the Savior prophesied. The Savior prophesied. Now, it's important that we understand the context. Paul, of course, before his conversion to Christianity, was a zealous Jew. In fact, he was a a teacher of the Jews. Take your Bibles and go with me to Philippians 3 quickly this morning. Philippians chapter 3. We need to understand Paul's background before he became a preacher of the gospel. Philippians chapter 3, and I want you to look at verse number 5. And Paul gives us his, if you will, testimony prior to salvation. Philippians chapter three, verse number five, Paul says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. 
Paul was a Jew. More than that, Paul was a, a teacher of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. He was a separatist. He was somebody who knew a lot about the Old Testament. He knew a lot about uh, what was written in the prophets and in the Psalms and, and in the books of history. Paul knew a lot about those things. And he mentions in verse number two of our text today, letter A, the prophets. Notice he's, he mentions that, which he had promised before by his prophets. Paul says, I know about the prophets. Who are the prophets, Paul? Paul would say they were that select group in the Old Testament through whom God revealed his future and his future plans and purposes. Sometimes these prophets were referred to as seers. They were inspired by God and they were able to predict future events with absolute certainty. Strong's concordance said about this word prophet that it means a foreteller. Notice what he says in the verse there, by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. And that's an important qualifier because it's teaching us that these prophets spoken of here refers to those who are God's spokesmen in the Old Testament. Peter said in 1 Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter 1, 21, that the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And as a Jew, Paul would have been familiar with the prophets. Paul also would have been familiar with, letter B, the promises. Look at it with me in verse number one. He mentions the gospel of God, verse two, which he had promised. There's the word. The gospel of God, which he had promised. You see, God, through the prophets, God, through these spokesmen in the Old Testament, relayed promises that were pertaining to, it says it right there, the gospel of God. That word gospel is a word that means good news. According to Paul here in Romans 1, this gospel, while given by the prophets, did not originate with the prophets. Notice what he did not say. He did say it was not the gospel of the prophets. Amen. It's the gospel of God, the Bible says, which he had promised afore by his prophets. Now you say, what, is, what does all this have to do with anything? Believe me, we're going somewhere. Paul knew about the prophets. Paul knew about the promises. In fact, we know that that first promise given in Genesis 3.15 was given directly by God. The first messianic prophecy that was ever given was given directly by God when he said to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. Thou shalt bruise his heel. What a promise, by the way. What good news in light of such tragic news. Yes, Adam and Eve messed up. Yes, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. But immediately after their sin, God steps up to the stage, steps up to the microphone, steps out on the stage and says, let me tell you, salvation is on the way. The first promise given directly by God. And indeed, Paul, a Jewish teacher, he knew about the prophets. Paul even knew about the promise. Some have suggested that there are as many as 351 direct promises given by the prophets in the Old Testament concerning Christ. But as a Pharisee, as one who prided himself in his religious knowledge and accomplishments, don't miss this. While he knew about the prophets and the promises, he missed the person. Look at it with me, verse number three. Those prophecies, those promise, uh, promises, verse three, were all concerning God's son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Home and Study Bible said it like this. The good news is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, and the Old Testament is not correctly understood apart from the New Testament. That word concerning is really important. J. Vernon McGee said that that word concerning means to circle. In other words, don't miss this. Every time one of those prophets in the Old Testament would speak forth one of those inspired promises given by God, it was always pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was always circling the person of Jesus. The word means it's about him. It's pertaining to him. Jesus Christ our Lord. And don't miss this truth today. And I think somebody needs to hear this this morning at Calvary Baptist Church. It is possible to understand that God chose prophets to reveal his promises but miss the person. Amen. There's a lot of people, if not in this room, in many churches across America today who know this Bible really well. Maybe even taught a Sunday school this morning. And guess what? They don't know Jesus. That's who Paul was. It could be said about Paul, listen to this, that he was lost in religion. 
The Old Testament, all 37 books that Paul knew very well were all about one person, and that person was Jesus. But Paul missed it. Harold Wilmington said this, the author, uh, he's, he is the author of Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, and he said this, the Bible is a Christ-centered book. The Old Testament is the preparation for his life. The Gospels are a manifestation of his life. The book of Acts, a propagation of his life, and the epistles, an explanation of his life. Jesus testified of this truth in Luke 24, 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Amen. This Bible is all about one person. That person is Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen to this poem. It's called, I Find My Lord in the Book. I find my Lord in the Bible wherever I chance to look. He is the theme of the Bible, the center and heart of the book. He is the rose of Sharon. He is the lily fair. Wherever I open my Bible, the Lord of the Bible is there. He's at the beginning. He gave to the earth its form. He is the ark of the shelter bearing the brunt of the storm, the burning bush of the desert, the budding of Aaron's rod. Wherever I look in my Bible, I see the Son of God. The ram upon Mount Moriah, the ladder from earth to sky, the scarlet cord in the window, the serpent lifted high, the smitten rock in the desert, the shepherd with staff and crook, the face of my Lord I discover wherever I open the book. He's the seed of the woman, the Savior, virgin born. He is the son of David, whom men rejected with scorn. His garments of grace and beauty, that stately Aaron deck. He is a priest forever, for he is Melchizedek. He's the Lord of eternal glory, whom John in a vision saw, light of the golden city, lamb without spot or flaw, bridegroom coming at midnight, for whom the virgins look. Whenever I open my Bible, I find my Lord in the book. Amen. You see, what Paul had missed earlier in his life due to the blinding ability of religion, now he understood. These Old Testament prophets, with all of their God-given promises, were fulfilled or will be fulfilled in one person, Jesus Christ our Lord. But that's not quite enough. We need to go to number two, and that is the son's power. What is it about Jesus that is worth serving? What is it about Jesus Christ that makes him a Lord that is worth serving? And it's interesting, for now we begin to see more specifically that Paul's life and Paul's ministry were motivated by the reality of who Jesus Christ truly is. And I want to make a bold statement this morning here at Calvary Baptist Church. What you actually believe, not what you claim to believe, not what you, you know, what you say with your mouth, but what you actually believe about Jesus Christ will ultimately determine the extent to which you live and serve him. I believe that. What I'm saying is this, Paul was religious, he was devoutly religious in his previous life, but he was emphatically opposed to Christianity. Why? Because Paul didn't believe that Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. He didn't believe that Jesus Christ was actually anointed by God, chosen by God to be the Savior of the world. But now Paul has made a 180 degree turn. The same Savior whom he was opposing, now he's serving. What made the difference? What made the difference? How do you go from vehemently opposing Jesus to boldly preaching Jesus? And here's the answer to the question. Hope everybody will get this this morning. It was Paul's heart belief concerning who Jesus was and is. This is why Jesus specifically conf <clears throat> confronted his disciples in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 17. He says to his disciples, I'm paraphrasing, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? Oh, they say you're Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. What did Jesus say to them? Okay, who do you say I am? And Peter responded, what had not been revealed to him by flesh and blood, but what had been revealed to him by the Father in heaven, and that is to say uh, that we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I believe Peter meant that, but I, I tell you, P Peter had not put all the pieces together because he denied the Lord three times before his death. But you know what changed is when Jesus met Peter on that seashore that day and he baked that bread and that fish and made a meal for them and said, Simon Peter, do you love me? I think we could also say that Jesus in that moment was confronting him with the reality of who he is. Simon Peter, look at me. You know I went to that cross. You know what they did to my body on that cross. But you see me here today. I am Jesus. I am the Christ, the son of the living God. 
What was it about Paul's belief about Jesus, though? We just need to look at two things quickly. What was it that caused that radical shift in his life? I think two things that Paul mentions about Jesus. First of all, we need to notice Jesus' humanity. Look at verse 3. He says, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, look at this, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, at first glance, we may get a little nervous about this verse and think, what is this talking about? I want to say that it's not teaching this morning. It's not teaching that Jesus Christ is a created being. As we'll see in just a moment, Jesus Christ is God. He is co-equal with the Father, co-equal with the Spirit, co-identical in his essence, co-eternal in his being. John 1 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's Jesus. But hear me out this morning. As We don't hear a lot of preaching about this, but as true as it is to say that Jesus Christ is God, it is equally as true to say that Jesus Christ is man. He's called many times in the scripture, the son of man, referring to his humanity. A.W. Tozer said this, if I can say it reverently, he seemed, Jesus seemed proud or at least delighted that he was a man, the son of man. Our verse today, notice in your verse, uh, verse three in your Bible, he was, Jesus was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Joseph Benson said this means with regard to his human nature. You remember John 1, 14, and the word God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Listen to me this morning. Jesus Christ was fully human. Now, I know we don't talk about that a lot, but it's important. And it means because he was fully human that as a human being, he experienced the fullness of the human experience. The only exception being he did not have a sin nature. Jesus knows what it means to be a man, for he became man. That's what we celebrate in the Christmas season. And the fact that Paul says here that he was made of the seed of David according to the flesh tells us two things. First of all, it tells us that Jesus was a literal historical figure. He wasn't a spirit being. He literally took on flesh. He is God incarnate. He is in the flesh, God in the flesh. He walked upon this earth. He talked upon this earth for approximately 33 and a half years. And did you know this? This is kind of good. And by the way, for those of you young people who are in college, you need to know this. In order for a person to be declared as a literal historical figure, according to history, they have to meet something called the minimal facts of history. And if they don't meet those minimal facts, then they're not going to be uh, considered to be a literal person in history. And you know what? This is amazing. Jesus Christ meets all of the, the minimal facts requirements. You know what's been proven? He was crucified. His tomb was found empty. His disciples believed that he appeared to them. The resurrection was proclaimed just days after the actual event and on and on and on and on. What are you saying? What I'm saying to you is when we just celebrated Christmas uh, two weeks ago, we weren't celebrating some fairy tale. We weren't celebrating some Disney, you know, story. Man, we were celebrating a literal event that God, the God of heaven, the creator of the universe, left the splendor and throne of heaven and came to this earth to be born. Oh, he took upon flesh. And this is important. Number two, it tells us that he was of the seed of David. And on the surface, that may not seem important to you, but it's very, very important because on a human level, that is what qualifies him as Messiah. I'll give you some verses. 2 Samuel 7, 16, God made a promise to David, and this is what he said. Thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. Go read Matthew chapter one. You know what it says? He is Jesus Christ Christ the son of David. And you consider, think about this for a second, consider how important that would have been for Paul, who was formerly a Jewish teacher. You see, now Paul was convinced that on a human level, Jesus Christ checked all of the boxes as Messiah. We see Paul, we see rather Jesus' humanity. We see his deity. Look at verse four. And if you checked out, come on, get back in on this part. Verse four. Not only was he made of the seed of David according to the flesh, verse four, and 
declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Paul says, I want everybody to look at me for a second. I 100% believe Jesus was a literal historical figure. He came to this earth and was born. He had human flesh like we, we do other than the fact that he did not have a sin nature. But I want to tell you what else I believe about him. Not only was he fully human, but he was fully God. He's the son of man. He is the son of God. And there's no conflict in that statement. He is fully uh, human and fully God. In theology, this is referred to as the hypostatic union. It means personal. That's what the word means. It's the personal union of Jesus to nature. He's not two persons. He's one person. The union, the hypostatic union is the joining of the divine and the human in one person who is Jesus. It's true to say Jesus Christ was fully God who became fully man without ceasing to become, without ceasing to be fully God. And that's really important. And, and it really should be deemed important by us. Paul says, I believe that he is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. But look at this. Look at the next word. And declared. Mark that word in your Bible and get ready to write this down. That word declared means to mark out or bound. It's the Greek word horizo. And it, we get our word horizon from this word. Now, come on. Come on. Check in with me for a second. Don't miss this. In the morning when you get up and you watch the horizon... How many of you know you can see the effects of the sun before you actually see the sun? You can even see the rays of the sun coming across the hill before you actually see the sun in the sky. Hey, everybody listen to me for a moment. All throughout Jesus' life, through his miracles, his perfection, his ministry, his ability to heal, and all those things that happened throughout his life, you know what they were? They were rays coming from the sun. They were, I'm getting excited about this part. They were things that said, hey, he's the one. He's the one. I know he looks like a man. You remember the disciples on the boat of that, on the front of that ship that day when he said, peace be still. And the waters and the winds obeyed and they were still as glass. And they stepped out there and said, behold, what manner of man is this? Who is this guy? They hadn't put all the pieces together yet, but buddy, they were starting to see rays from the sun. But I want you to listen to me this morning. Listen, Jesus Christ went to a cross and he gave his life on that cross for our sins. They took his lifeless body off the cross and wrapped it in uh, cloths and they laid his body in a tomb. And day one passed and some people said he must have only been a man. Day two passed and they said he must have only been a man. But on that third day, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. You know what happened that day? They said, man, I remember seeing the rays coming up over the hill and I began to think maybe he is the Messiah. But on that day when he rose again, you know what everybody said? There's no doubt about it, he is. He was declared to be the son of God. This happens a lot more out maybe in our area in Los Angeles. But have you ever thought you saw somebody who was important? You know, you're like, you see somebody, you're like, man, I think that's who that is. Maybe you see them from behind or from the side, and you're like, man, that really looks like that's them. But then all of a sudden, they turn and look at you, and you go, that's them. There's no doubt about it, 100%, that's them. That's exactly what happened with Jesus. He was declared to be the son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. And did you notice, and I've got to quit, but did you notice that it's, there's the, the Trinity in this verse? You see, look at verse number four. He's declared to be, look at this, the son of God. That's the son, Jesus Christ, and the father. But look at this. The Bible says, and he was, uh, uh, according to the spirit, there it is, according to the spirit of holiness. That's the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Godhead in verse number four. We see last of all this morning, number three, the servant's purpose. Paul, what, what was it that motivated you? How could you say at the end of your life, I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, I finished my course? I think we see the story here. Look at uh, verse number one, and we see, or verse number five, rather, verse number five, we see, first of all, the origin of Paul's purpose. Now, here's the point of my message today. 
Paul was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was indeed who he claimed to be, Lord and Savior. And that was his motivation for ministry. Look at verse five. By whom? You see how important the context is? The God who left heaven and came to this earth and took on flesh, the God who was crucified on the cross, laid in a tomb, and three days later he got up from the grave. I'm called by that Savior. The risen Lord of glory, the resurrected Lord of glory has invited me to have a part in his story. Do you see how much more powerful that motivation is than doing it for Zach? Or doing it for your husband or your wife or your mom or dad or your pastor as good as a man as he is? I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus is our motivation for ministry this morning. The origin of Paul's purpose. Note that Paul says in verse number one, the Lord, he said, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ called to be an apostle. Paul says, the Lord has called me. He has invited me to have a part in his story. But not only had Paul, uh, God called Paul, but he had also enabled Paul to complete what he had called him to do. Look at verse number five. By whom? That is by Jesus, the risen, resurrected Lord of glory. We have received, everybody shout that next word, grace. Grace. My personal definition of the word grace is God accomplishing in and through me what I could never accomplish on my own. And while the work of grace begins in salvation, I want to say it continues to unveil itself in every facet of the Christian life. Brother Looney, every day of my life, I need grace. I'm going to tell you, I don't know. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know what 2021 holds, y'all. It might be great. Maybe COVID goes away soon and we just get back to normal, but I'm going to be honest. We don't know what's going to happen. But here's what I do know. Listen to this. His grace is sufficient. And I'm going to tell you what I believe, Dad. I believe that God wants to do some amazing things through Calvary Baptist Church in 2021. And maybe some of you have been cowering in fear and thinking, well, we can't do anything because it's COVID. It's 2021. And everybody's on pause. And I guess we'll just have to wait to do anything. But listen, our God works in the midst of difficult situations. Oh, he has grace. He has every bit of what you need to accomplish what he wants you to accomplish. By the way, according to Romans 12, 6, every believer has been given grace, a God-given ability to accomplish your role in his body. We see the origin. Paul says, this, is, this calling and my enabling is coming from this resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. But then we see his obedience. Look at verse number five, and we gotta get to the end here. By whom we have received grace and apostleship, here it is, for obedience. And this is where Paul's responsibility came in. And this is where your responsibility comes in. It means to be submitted or compliant. God has given me grace to accomplish his purposes in my life. I am enabled through Christ. The question is, will I be submitted to what God wants to do in my life in 2021? And I want you to listen to me. It's not a question of can God. It's a question of will you. It's not, God's not limited by COVID. God's not limited by human circumstances that we're dealing with right now. So it's not, we're not, we shouldn't be worried like, I wonder if God can do anything in 2021. It's not a question of can God. The question boils down to will we? Will we be obedient? Will we be submitted? I'm just gonna jump to my last point. We see last of all, the opportunity. Look at verse five, and this is so good. Like I believe this for 2021 by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience. By the way, Paul wasn't just content with being obedient himself. He wanted to lead others into that obedience. And look what he says, for obedience to the faith. Now, come on, lean in at this last part. Among all nations for his name. Because Paul understood the origin of his purpose and his responsibility to be obedient in that purpose, God used him to do great things. I don't know what your theme is gonna be or even if you're gonna have a theme for this year. Maybe you have a personal theme for 2021. I've got a good one for you. It's right there in verse five. Among all nations for his name. You see, when you realize, and here's the whole thing. If you, when you realize Jesus is who he said he was, He's not just uh, another God on the shelf with a whole plethora of other gods. He is the risen, resurrected Lord of glory. 
When you really get to that point when you say, you know what, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There's nothing that we can say, well, I, you're not quite worth going to that place. You're not quite worth giving up that. No, when we see who he really is, we'll be willing to say, Lord, here it is. It's all yours. I'll go anywhere, do anything, say anything. I'll be who you want me to be. Let's bow our heads this morning. What is your motivation in ministry? I spoke to saved people today. I spoke to the believers. What's your motivation? What is it that propels you forward in the Christian life? Praise? You waiting for that pat on the back? Say, well, nobody told me I did a good job singing, so I'm not singing anymore. Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it because other people are doing it? Prosperity? Or are you surrendered today and submitted to God and saying, God, whatever you want, wherever you want me to go, whoever you want me to reach, it's going to be based on this principle. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. He's God who became the Son of Man so that I could become the Son of God. Lord, your Messiah, risen Lord, the one who has called me, the one who has enabled me, you're sustaining me, you're filling me with your power to accomplish your purposes in me among all nations for your name. I don't really know how to lead this invitation, but I wonder if there might be some people who might be willing to just surrender today. And maybe you would come down to this altar and kneel and say, God, I just want you to use me. I believe everything that the Bible says about who Jesus is. And God, I want you to use me however, wherever, whenever. Maybe it'll be here at Calvary. Maybe it'll just be right here in this church. God's gonna point to you and say, hey, I want you to lead that ministry. I want you to accomplish this. Now, I wonder if we'll have some people who say, God, I'm surrendered. I'm submitted. I'm motivated to minister because you are who you said you were. Father, I pray you'll bless this invitation now. Encourage us to serve you in 2021. These are difficult days. It's not a question, though, of can God. It's a question of will we. Help us to be surrendered. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's do business with the Lord. Let's all stand around the building today. Now is the time to respond to the message. Now's the time to respond. Jesus, you are who you said you are. I believe it with my heart. And I'm going to give my life to you. May the Lord help us. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I was thinking while Brother Zach was closing up the message there, one of these days we're going to stand. If we're saved, we're going to stand at something called the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat will not be a judgment of works, but the judgment seat will be a judgment of motives. Why did you do what you did? Why did you serve the Lord? And I wonder today, what is it that motivates you to serve the Lord? Folks are in the altar. Let me just ask a question or two with heads bowed. Number one, I wonder how many may be here today and you'd say, Brother Steve, if I, if I died today, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm on my way to heaven. I know that I'm, I've been born again. I know it. And if you can honestly say that today, would you slip your hand up? You can take it right back down. God bless you. A lot of hands. Thank you so much. I wouldn't embarrass you for the world. I won't come back and try to drag you down the aisle. But I would like to do this. I'd like to pray for you. God will know who you are. And I wonder if there might be one here today, anywhere around this auditorium, and you would say, Preacher, I'm going to be honest between me and the Lord right now. If I died today, if something happened, I had a heart attack or there was a car accident or, or something in my life in today, today I'm, not, I'm not 100% sure that I would make it to heaven and I want you to remember me. Is there one today? You'd slip your hand up right now. Just raise it up high so I don't miss you. And you'd say, preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure about heaven. I want to go. I want to go. But I'm not sure about heaven. I want you to pray for me. Is there one like that anywhere right now? You'd raise it up high so I don't miss you this morning. Is there one? Preacher, remember me. Remember me. We're going to pause just for a few moments. And the folks have used the altar today, but maybe there's others.
that ought to come. While we pause just for a moment, we, we'll sing in, in a minute maybe, but while we pause for just a moment uh, with our heads bowed, I'm going to make my way to the main floor. And if you're here today and you need prayer, we're going to be here for you. We'll be glad to pray with you. If you've got a burden on your heart, you need somebody, somebody to pray with you, we'll be, we'll be glad to pray with you. It could be you're here today You say, Pastor, I've been saved, but I've never followed the Lord in baptism. And today, maybe you need to come and make yourself a candidate for baptism. Maybe you're here, you say, Preacher, I'm saved and baptized, but I'm not the member of a good Bible-believing church. God's leading us to possibly join with Calvary. And whatever it may be, maybe you're here today. You say, Pastor, I am saved, but I've strayed. And it is time for me to rededicate my life to Christ. I realize He is the Savior. I realize that He is God incarnate, God in flesh. And today I need to rededicate my life to Jesus. And so we'll pause just for a moment. You come while we wait. If we can help you, we're here for you today. Let's use the altar, Calvary. Let go and let God have His way today. You come while we wait. While folks are in the altar this morning, you can look up this way. But they don't take us to that next frame, if you will. We're going to sing our invitation chorus this morning. Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. I want you to sing it out today, realizing that he is who he said he is. And you know what? He is worthy of our service in 2021. I'll promise you that. The greatest decision that you'll make in 2021 is just to surrender your life to him and say, this is it. This is it, man. I'm just going to serve God for the rest of my life. I don't know how much time I have, but how much, how much, how much, how much time I have, I want to give it to Him. We're going to sing that chorus today. You sing it out and sing it to the Lord today. All right. Jesus, use me. Here we go. Let's sing it. Ready? Jesus, use me. And oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Sure. The work that I can do, and even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Let's sing it again. Sing it out now. Think about it. Jesus, use me, and oh, Lord, don't. Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Honey, give us the key, if you will. Let's sing it ready. Jesus, see you. And, oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Think about it. Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Though the cause be great I'll work for you keep that going if you will hey Calvary 
2021 or 2020, how many would agree it was a difficult year? I'm going to be quite honest with you. I hope it's not this way. But how many know that 2021 could be a lot more difficult? We think that all is hunky-dory and footloose and fancy-free and we're living in America and everything's great and it is. But the truth of the matter is, things could change. And in just in a little bit of time, the cost of serving Jesus Christ could be great. And there's a lot of Christians that are willing to sign on as long as we still have freedom to carry our Bibles and come to church without any persecution and but I just wonder today, if the cost became great, I wonder how many would hang in there serving Christ. We're going to sing it one last time. This is it. We're going to the house. We're willing. But I want you to sing this to the Lord. Let's sing it together. Ready, Calvary? Jesus, use me. And no Lord, don't refuse me. Sure. There's a work that I can do, and even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Think about it. Though the cost be great, I'll work for you, and He's worthy. Amen. He is worthy. He's worthy of our service. We're glad you're here today. Thank you, Brother Zach, for the great message today. I'll ask Brother Zach to meet you at the door, and then you be sure you find be sure you find Amber as well, and welcome them uh, welcome them home today. And listen, we hope you have a great afternoon. And then tonight, we're excited about tonight. Zach and Amber will be back with us tonight, and then Brother Jason Holt and his family will be with us in the uh, evening service. And evangelist Daniel Waters will be here tonight, and we're going to have a time in the house of the Lord. And so I hope that you'll plan on being back here. Uh, the service will start at 6. The doors will be open much sooner than that. And so I encourage you to be here, be in your places, and we'll look forward to a wonderful time in the Lord's house tonight. All right. God bless you. Brother Ricky, how about you? Uh, come on up here, if you will, and I want you to pray for us today. And uh, listen, fellowship, and we'll see you. Lord willing, we'll see you tonight. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Just thank you for getting us through 2020 and into 2021, Lord. And I pray that we'll do more work for you in 2021 than we've ever done before. Lord, thank you for sending Brother Zach and his family home safely. And Lord, just thank you for this message he brought to us this morning. Lord, I pray that we just uh, put this message in our heart and live by it, Lord, and just uh, do all that we can for you, serve you. For, for you, not for someone else. Help us not to get our eyes on someone else, focused on someone else, to, because they could fail us, and we know that, Lord, but you'll never fail us, and we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us throughout the day. Give us a good day. Keep us safe as we go home, and as we come back tonight, give us safety back. Pray that you'd be with uh, Brother Holt and Brother Waters, and the other ones that'll be with us tonight, Lord, I pray that you'd bless each and every one. Help us honor and glorify you in all that we do. Give us a good day. Keep us safe, and we love you. In your name we do pray. Amen. Thank you.